Good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you for us uh, for participating in this uh, webinar that we are developing with uh, the program Energetica. It is a research program who involves uh, several institutions, uh, eleven international institutions, eight universities, and three industrial companies, mainly from Colombia. I would like to thank all the participants, mainly uh, the, the presenters today. Uh, this webinar will be shared by uh, Professor Andrea Benigni uh, from Julich uh, Fortune Centrum. And um, it will be the participation of uh, Professor Antonello Monti uh, and uh, Mauricio Sanchez and Victor Hilara from, from Opal. So, uh, Andrea, thank you, and I give you the word for for the webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, so, uh, welcome to these webinars on uh, real-time simulation advantage for large infrastructures. Um, okay, so without hesitating, um, you already heard the name of the four presenters of today. And what we are going to do is each one of us will give a 10 minutes uh, a presentation about uh, his opinion and his everyday work on the, I would say, not only advantage, but also challenge and needs uh, for large system infrastructure, uh, real time simulation. Uh, and after we will have more of a panel section where we hope to have a nice discussion with everyone um, that is participating in the webinar. So uh, without uh, um, losing more time, I will let uh, uh, Victor Hirata uh, to um, give his presentation. And also, I will ask every, uh, every one of the presenters, please briefly introduce yourself at the start of the presentation. Okay? Thank you. Uh, can you can you see my screen? Very well, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say thank you for your participation and also for the organization for this invitation. Uh, my name is Victor Hirata, and uh, I'm the business unit manager for Latin America at OPOWRT Technologies. Um, just a, a very brief uh, uh, introduction about myself. I'm an electronic key technician. I had a bachelor degree in computer engineer and also MBA in people development. I started to work for Opal RT in November 2017, but before also I worked for National Instruments, uh, now an I company, and also six years at General Motors, where my main um, role was to build the hardware in the loop system for product development and validation. Just a very quick introduction about OPOWRT for the people who don't know. Uh, the company was established in 1997 in Montreal, and we are specialized in real-time simulators. Uh, our president, uh, Jean Belanger, he spent uh, 25 years at IREC, which is the Energy Research Center, Center from Hydro-Quebec. Uh, working with a non-linear control systems, uh, modelization and simulation. Of course, back that time, uh, the simulation was analog, not digital as we have uh, nowadays. Uh, our goal is to provide platforms to test and validate uh, some uh, electrical and control systems, uh, which can be done uh, through several ways, uh, what I'm going to briefly introduce uh, today. And uh, we also, uh, our goal is to use uh, standard components uh, called COTS or commercial off the shelf on our solutions. It means that uh, uh, our technology is based on Intel processors and FPGAs from Dynelix. And uh, uh, we try to be as open as possible, uh, bringing some uh, uh, third part uh, uh, simulation language such as MATLAB, Simulink, ESSE, uh, PESIN, and others uh, to our uh, platform and run those models in real time. Uh, this is uh, our overview in Latin America. Uh, we, we are 
uh, very present in Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Ecuador, Puerto Rico, and Costa Rica. Uh, but definitely, if we compare the the number of systems that we have in Latin America, uh, in comparing to the US, Europe, and Asia, we are in the beginning phase of the product adoption. Uh, so what is uh, real-time simulation? Uh, when we are talking about this technology, uh, we basically start with uh, a modeling uh, the circuit, and this is what we want to study. Uh, sorry, there is some noise, uh, background noise. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I, I would ask if you can close your microphone. Thank you. And uh, the idea is to, once we develop the model here uh, using a simulation tool, uh, we can import that model to a, a real-time platform. And in our case, we run a Linux RT operational system uh, to guarantee the priority of the execution and also the, the time step, uh, which is the most important factor of a real-time simulation. Uh, this is what we call determinism. Okay, and uh, it's to make sure that the time, st time step that I define for my execution will be uh, respected no matter what. And additionally, the, the real-time simulator is capable to, to connect to uh, external devices through uh, IOs, analog and digital uh, inputs and outputs, and then uh, we can uh, simulate the real environment to test those uh, controllers or components. Uh, in general concepts, uh, the real-time simulation is not a, as fast as, uh, I would say, it's not very fast. That's a, a concept sometimes people uh, misunderstand because uh, they think uh, real time is uh, very, very fast. But this is not the true. Uh, actually, uh, real time means as fast as possible. It means that if we are simulating a power electronic uh, circuit or, or a simulation or a model, uh, I would require nanoseconds of time step because uh, we have a very uh, high speed uh, switching frequency on that simulation. But uh, on the other hand, if we are simulating a temperature control, uh, I, I don't need a very fast simulation because the temperature uh, change uh, very slow, I would say. In, in that case, my time step uh, would be in seconds. So uh, in summary, the idea of a real-time simulation is to allow the configuration of uh, different types of time step depending on the, the study that I will perform on, on, the, on the platform. And, and the main benefits, uh, just to be very quick here, uh, is to um, uh, make the, the tests or, or to verify the, the system uh, where it's difficult to handle, uh, especially in, in the field. Uh, or is, is very expensive to uh, do the tests and sometimes it's very dangerous to, to perform those tests. Uh, when we are using a simulation tool, uh, it's easier to uh, configure some scenarios uh, which in the field uh, normally is not so easy to, to perform those tests. Uh, there are several ways to uh, simulate uh, uh, a system, and these are some of them. Uh, the, the main factor here is that we can use the same platform to perform those different types of application. Uh, just to uh, not uh, to go deeper uh, in, in all those uh, options here, but uh, uh, the model in the loop is where when we simulate uh, 100 percent uh, virtually, my model. Uh, the RCP is a replica control prototype where I simulate the control algorithm of my system and uh, I can connect my simulator to a real plant. Also, it's possible to perform a hardware in the loop where uh, the, the control is real and uh, I use the simulator to uh, have the plant or to emulate the plant of my system. 
And uh, finally, uh, there is a variation of a hardware in the loop called the power hardware in the loop, where I have this, uh, the, this stage, the power stage, to connect the, the simulator because uh, the simulator can generate only a control level for the signals. Uh, it means a very low uh, current and low voltage. And if I want to connect to real devices, power devices, I will need a power amplifier to uh, uh, raise the, the level of uh, uh, voltage and current. Uh, these are some projects that we have have been done uh, for for the years, and uh, one of them is what we call Nanao project. And uh, our mission here is to accelerate the development and validation of new technologies. And uh, this is uh, uh, an HVDC project uh, using a multi-level converter technology. And uh, this is uh, used a high degree of complexity. And uh, uh, we have to deploy all the test bed in a, a very um, advanced methodology. And in th this case, uh, the MMC uh, system was, uh, it is located in Nanao, uh, which is a province in China. And uh, we work it together with EPRI Institute, which is the energy uh, research center in China. And uh, this te test bench supply of uh, 200 megawatts of a transmission system. And uh, we, we simulate all the control and protection system, uh, which is a very complex system uh, based on a, a multi-layer structure, uh, which contains more than 10 feeders and more than 25 interconnected uh, cabinets. Uh, another example is uh, the laboratory from Hydro-Quebec. Uh, which is one of the most uh, extensive uh, uh, and um, uh, modern uh, laboratories for real-time simulation. Uh, Hydro-Quebec has uh, more than 33,000 uh, kilometers of line, transmission lines. And uh, the, actually, OPOWRT technologies was born inside IREC, as I mentioned before. And uh, back to the, the uh, 90s, uh, 1970s, uh, Jean Belanger started this idea to, to simulate uh, the, the transmission uh, control systems. Uh, and uh, so he started this, uh, this laboratory in the beginning. And uh, of course, he uh, left uh, Hydro-Quebec in, in 1997 to, to start his own business. But still, uh, the, the laboratory has many tools and uh, it's possible to validate uh, many controllers, uh, which includes effects, HVDC, wind energy integration, smart grids, uh, once, uh, which is a wide area monitoring system and protection. Uh, some of tools that uh, IREC uh, developed, I I'm not sure if everybody knows that, but uh, IREC developed the, the Simscape electrical uh, toolkit for Simulink. Uh, also, IREC uh, developed the EMTPRV environment, also the HyperSIM, which is the real-time version for the EMTPRV uh, platform. And uh, uh, finally, uh, this is a new concept that we are discussing nowadays called uh, digital twins. And uh, uh, Actually, digital twins, many people think that is just a simulation, but actually uh, it, for us is more than this, uh, because a digital twin must have a connectivity bridge uh, within the real world. Uh, necessarily, it has to be self-adaptive, uh, and the digital twins is a, a real-time copy of the physical twin. So in that sense, uh, if it is a dynamic model, it must have a parameter identification and provides additional information to the control algorithm. Uh, and uh, it, it can be used to, to support a control tools, uh, allowing a better decision making and to respond uh, to stimulus and uh, uh, for predictive design and 
planning tools. Uh, this is, as I said, a very new concept that we are uh, using the real-time simulation uh, to advance the, the predictive tools and, and also to uh, increase the reliability of the algorithms inside of a, of a control plan. So this is what I had for today. And uh, thank you very much for the time. Um, and uh, so I'll be here if you have any questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Victor. Uh, it's a very, very nice presentation and actually very instrumental to, I think, the next presentation because you also uh, took the time to introduce a few concepts of real-time simulation, hardware in the loop, and so on, that are for sure um, yeah, very useful for today's webinar. Uh, okay, so we can go um, for the next presenter. Um, so, Ivan Pablo, can you share the screen? Uh, or let me share. Uh, so, uh, next presenter um, was supposed to be uh, Professor Monti, uh, but uh, I think he's having some trouble with uh, his connection because he couldn't hear before and he had some trouble. So, um, if it's fine for everyone, I would directly jump to the third presenter, that is Mauricio Sanchez. And uh, Mauricio, please. Uh, we can share your Andrea, screen. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Oh, <laughs> I just made it. <laughs> okay, go ahead with the, the, the change of schedule. Just want to be sure now you can hear me. Um, yeah. <laughs> no problem. So, yes, we, we go ahead uh, with Mauricio, if you don't mind, and then sure, we we'll sure. uh, shift the presentation of uh, Antonello Monti to the next one. Mauricio, please, uh, we can share your screen. I'm sorry, I was in mute. <laughs> Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, on behalf of XM, here is uh, Mauricio Sanchez. I've been working for XM for, let's say, 15 years now. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, our R&D experience with uh, um, simulators, with real-time simulators. We uh, going to speak about uh, some of the activities, some of the projects that we have been undertaking here in our in our lab. Let me share with my screen. Okay, I think that everyone is is watching watching this right now. Am I right? Yes, Mauricio. We are. Okay, so. Um, we, we, we have been uh, working in this lab for uh, since 2016, I guess. We acquired a, a real-time simulator from, from Opal RT. Uh, this simulator is a Intel Xeon 16-core uh, uh, computer with an F uh, Xilinx uh, FPGA. We have 32 uh, analog uh, input, uh, inputs and outputs, uh, and also 32 digital input and outputs and, and a synchronization card for the GPS system. Um, what kind of project do we have undertaken in this lab? Uh, well, we, we, we are very concerned for the future of the power system in terms of the advanced supervision, for example. Uh, one of the things we have developed or we have investigated the most is the population of the complete power system with PMUs. Right now, we are kind of advancing that topic. Uh, right now, we have installed around uh, 30, 30 to 40 PMUs in the power system, and, and we have a complete substation, completely supervised with, with PMUs in the north of the Colombian uh, power system. We also have work in automatic voltage and frequency control. Uh, I'm going to speak about some uh, activities on that uh, in the next slides. Uh, we also have work in, in an automatic and protection control, uh, mostly incorporating or, or taking into account PMU information. We also have done microgrid simulation and control. And uh, lastly, finally, we have done some simulation on, on, the on a special kind of aggregator that is, uh, that is uh, very, very in in the, in the trends of uh, the incorporation of renewables in, 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 in distribution power systems. We have called it the virtual power plant emulation. 
right now we have working we have working uh, around 10 people in this project and every day we are incorporating more more and more uh, equipments more assets to the laboratory uh, to be prepared for the challenges of the of the future uh, one of the of the first things we did uh, uh, with the acquisition of this laboratory was the migration of the Colombian power system to the tools in the in the that uh, uh, Opal RT gave us to, to perform different simulation in different in time frames or different uh, uh, kind of simulation. Given that we are the independent power system operator of Colombia, we are we were more interested in simulations that uh, can incorporate large power systems and large number of big number of buses. Uh, so we were very interested in the in the in the beginning in the e-phaser sim tool which is the tool that OpalRT provides to perform RMS simulation in, in phaser domain. So the first thing we did was, uh, you know, walking in, in little baby steps to the simulation of uh, benchmark systems like this one, the, the IEEE 39 bus system. So we began with this system. We tried to understand how to model different components, uh, try to reproduce the, the, simula the, the simulation results and try to compare those results between the tool that we already have here in, in, in XM, which is the Dixilin Power Factory. This is our main tool to perform the different uh, dynamic analysis and security analysis in the power system. And then when we learn how to uh, translate all the parameters from that database into the into the new e phaser sim environment, then we migrate to to the real power system. So we began with a portion of, of, of the North Columbia power system, and we simulate this in, 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 in the Xilin, and also we did it with the phaser sim. And we, once we had the match in between the simulation, then we got finally to the to the simulation to in, in the complete power system. Uh, let's say that we not also have the Columbia power system simulated, but also the Equatorian one, because we are connected in the South with uh, the with the uh, Equatorian power system. So once we had matching between the, the, the two models or the two ways to to or the two tools, then we, we managed to develop this uh, this automatic script in Python. We incorporate these Python scripts uh, to the structure of the Excellent uh, Power Factory database to automatically migrate all the components and build the, the full system the full system model in, in the phaser sim. Uh, basically, we run it in two steps. The first step is the modification of some uh, parameter changes in the in the original uh, Dixieland database. The first thing we do is uh, accommodate or adjust the generation power output of some generators to make it fulfill with their with their limits. The second thing we do is uh, change the model, the load model, to constant uh, impedance. The third thing is the tab changer line linearization, uh, which in, in the in, in our Dixieland database is model uh, is, is model uh, not in, in a non-linear way. Um, finally, we assign some standard models for governor, exciters, and, and fact devices and inverter J's, uh, inverter base uh, generators. And finally, uh, once uh, this is script has run. Then we uh, run another script that uh, automatically exports all the components and reads all the parameters. It does the bus reduction for the substation that, that the substations that are uh, very in detail model in the in the in the Xilin. We convert uh, this this uh, substation in a single bus bar in into the phase sourcing model. Um, uh, we migrate also and we read the the parameters of the load shedding the on the frequency load shedding scheme. Then we set all these parameters in the new tool, the phaser sim. And finally, um, this script produces or populates the Excel sheet, which is the input, the main input file to begin a, a, a real-time simulation. These are some results of the match between the Dixilin Power Factory and the phaser sim uh, results through a in, in, in a dynamic simulation that uh, you can say, in conclusion, that uh, they are performing in a in a pretty good uh, match. In, in, as a, they are, they're giving a very good match in, in in the calculations. 
so we are confident to to trust in the results uh, for the next uh, the next steps and the next step uh, was uh, this kind of project this one it was a special uh, protection scheme is uh, located in the south of colombia it's uh, located reading the all the variables in the interconnection with ecuador and uh, we had uh, the idea to make a new uh, protection scheme that replaces the the old one that uh, we had some problems with that because in uh, it was not uh, built with a with a professional or with a, a protection or with a tool that is capable of protecting the complete the, the, the stability of the power system against a lot of events that were happening during 2016 that threatened the stability in, in Colombia and even uh, we had some events of loss of load because of uh, events in, in, in the neighbor country. So uh, we implement a special protection scheme with uh, the use of uh, synchrophasor technology and also with um, uh, customized protections like, like uh, a kind of a stability detection, uh, the, 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 the stability assessment of the interconnection in the south of Colombia that can trip in, in very fast uh, uh, times, in milliseconds. So we, we did this, this protection scheme and with the use of the laboratory and, and the, the ones that we have already simulated and, and, and running in real time, the two power system, the Colombian and the Equatorian one. So we were able to, to design this automated test bed uh, and that it works uh, pretty much, pretty much uh, we migrate like around 2,000 cases uh, between different scenarios, operative scenarios, and different uh, events uh, in the power system that treated the stability in Colombia. Uh, and we were able to inject those cases one by one through an automatic uh, scripting in Python uh, to an, the amplifier. We were able to interact with, the, with this protection scheme and, after that, we capture all the results or the, let's say, pictures of the event that were captured by this uh, special protection scheme. We analyze those uh, outputs and we, through another scripting in Python, we analyze if they fulfill the criteria of coordination with the, with the protections in the south of, of, uh, of the country. So if, the, if, if they are coordinating, then we raise a flag of, of OK, this case was passed and we were able to detect if the logics uh, built within this protection scheme coordinated or not with the with the certain cases we were able we were able to run 2000 cases in less than 1 hour and analyze all those results and produce uh, finally a report that says if the protection scheme or protection logic is coordinated or not with the with the uh, with the protections uh, upward in the interconnection. Another taking advantage in advantage of this uh, development, then we migrate to to a protection relay test bed. We also Im implement this uh, test bed. And it's an, an automatic uh, test bed that can run different scenarios and different events. In a in this case, we use. A, a more simplified network. Uh, this is not uh, anymore a, a, an RMS simulation. This is an M AEMT simulation in the tra in transient domain. So for, for this case, we use the HyperSync, which is the tool that uh, OpalRT provides to the electromagnetic transient simulation types. And through a test view, which is another tool that uh, allows us to automate the simulation then we can change from one scenario to another scenario, and we can change the type of, of fault. For example, we can change from, from an injection of a single phase to ground fault at 5% of the, of the line to a, in another case in, very, in, in a matter of seconds, uh, in, uh, to a fault in the, in the middle of the line uh, with another topology of the fault and, and so on. Then we have another uh, simulated relay in the far end of the line to the two relays, the physical one and the simulated one that communicate into a special kind of, of uh, protocol, uh, POTT. In this case, uh, we were able to say if, uh, if we, if with uh, an evaluation logic, perform another, uh, again in Python, we were able to say if the, if the relay is 
behaving or is operating as is expected. Uh, how do we do that? Okay, uh, we design a decision tree algorithm that uh, learns from, from, from previous operation and is prepared to judge if the binary uh, inputs that were read that were read from from the from the contract files uh, stored by the relay in every case if the in and can judge if the if the behavior of the, the behavior of the relay was as expected or not in this case this script uh, at the end presents uh, to the to the to the to the engineer presents a table says if if the if saying if the if every case coordinates or not uh, or or uh, stating that the relay behaves or not as is as is expected. Something that is right now in, under development is not with uh, is not within right now is not within a hardware. It's in a software in the loop prototype. Uh, is the is the uh, con voltage control a coordinated voltage control strategy? It turns out that uh, we we have right now in our uh, control center in a centralized way we have the uh, a tertiary uh, centralized control for, for voltage that's supposed to give set points uh, to the to the voltage uh, set point voltage for the for the different buses in the power system the main ones so we designed this uh, decentralized secondary voltage controller is uh, built in a so separate software in a separate computer uh, this one basically reads all these set points uh, issued by the, the centralized tertiary voltage control and process it, uh, these, these, uh, um, these set points, uh, update the voltage and, and, and the network status from the simulator that is running in the, in the, in the Opel RT simulator with the complete power system. This is, this is a simulation in, in RMS domain. So we can read the phasors the simulated phasors in the c Simon protocol. We also read the topology and the status of uh, some top changers in the network that we are controlling. Uh, this, uh, once this is done, uh, we have uh, another uh, network sim simulation uh, in a in the separate computer that uh, runs this, this uh, short network and updates the equivalent, computates the voltage deviation from the, from the the pilot buses and the set points from the tertiary controller, and finally solve an optimization problems that at the end commands uh, movements or command positions of the top changers, uh, uh, tuned devices, and finally in, in the future we think that we can incorporate also uh, set points for exciters of generators. Uh, I was speaking uh, earlier about the virtual power plant. This is another software in the loop prototype. Uh, this one incorporates uh, a lot of simulated uh, assets, a lot of simulated uh, DERs uh, that are running into, into the, along with the big power system, they are running in, in, uh, in, in parallel with uh, the phase or same model in the, the, of the Columbia power system. So we have managed to uh, concentrate all those simulations, monitoring all, all of them uh, through UDP, UDP protocols and to IoT protocols. Uh, into a separate uh, solution in a separate computer. Uh, this uh, virtual power plant runs basically and performs a dispatch, uh, optimal dispatch. It's an optimization problem again. This optimization problem set the power set point for every, uh, for every one of these DERs. And they are executed, for example, with uh, one, one of special DER. Uh, we have a microgrid uh, simulation also in. Uh, running in very, very well detail uh, within the simulation. This one is uh, performed or is done in um, SIM power systems, uh, which is another tool that can read or can understand the language of the uh, real-time simulation uh, in, in the Opel RT tools. Uh, finally, this prototype it tends to simulate or to emulate what is going to happen here in the facilities of, uh, of ESA. Uh, we have building here in, in our facilities a microgrid, which is part of the other of, of other uh, projects in the in the Energetica 2030. Uh, this prototype uh, of microgrid is uh, behaving or is expecting to serve as a test bed for for for, for testing and uh, 
being a, being able to say if it's going to behave okay, it's going to behave good with the with the with what is expected. And uh, we did that uh, control in the RTAC 3555. It's a control that's supposed to manage all the all the internal DERs or the internal assets of the microgrid. For example, we control uh, a battery energy storage system. We also control set points or uh, curtail some power uh, in the inverters. We also manage a manageable load in, in one of the buildings. And we also incorporate a function uh, that can uh, dispatch uh, in, a, in an optimal way a diesel power plant in combination with the with the other sets of the power of the micro. So pretty much the, the, the all, all these are all the initiatives that uh, are currently under development here in in, in our lab. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm here pending of quest questions of uh, and, and clarifications. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Mauricio. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. And um, okay, so I will go now and give the words to Antonello Monti for the third presentation. So, Antonello, if you can share your screen. You see my slide? Perfect. Wonderful. And you can hear me also. Yes. <laughs> That's also okay. um, thank you very much. Uh, we'll um, cover the development of a set of tools that we call Villas, and we call the Villas concept, which is a way to integrate simulations and laboratory together through the internet to support uh, <clears throat> analysis of very large systems or to develop also concepts like simulation as a service. How do we reach this conclusion to, to develop such a project? Well, from practical experience, we realized that um, very quickly, if we need to run detailed real-time simulation, uh, we run into problem using a single setup, and that is limiting the possibility that we could cooperate also with other institutions. At the end, we'll say the second has been also more of a point uh, to, to create the possibility to share knowledge and data through different laboratories turned out to be a very difficult problem to solve without an appropriate solution. In particular, uh, this has been inspired beginning with some global changes, I would say, um, particularly the, the European Commission got in touch with the Department of Energy in the US because it turned out that experiments that are planned, for example, by the Chinese, with the Chinese state grid to create a global power grid, were requested to more and more cooperate also across the ocean, across continents, across large distance, and trying to check interoperability also between Europe and US, for example. And that's why we, we came to the conclusion that it's possible to imagine a global real-time simulation approach, sharing simulation capacity, hardware, real-time interface and prototyping, but on the other hand, having to tackle challenges like uh, latency created by large distance. Um, to create an intermediate layer in this problem, because as I say, the delay are significant, particularly when you talk about the link between US and Europe, um, we, we figured out that we need um, in an intermediate stage, so a simulator that was able to run with a larger time step and allowing them to have a more compatible type of interface among laboratories. And this brought us to develop the simulation DPSIM that was presented in a previous workshop um, in this series. So the ingredient that we put together uh, was common model format. We are focused on using common information models as a way to share data about different grids, uh, creating flexible interfaces. And I will come back a lot on this point and showing how we approach in this. But that means also common user interface so that people can visualize what they're jointly simulating and a layer of open solvers 
that allows the scalability of the solutions. These is are the ingredients that uh, define what we call the Villas framework, which is an open source toolkit for distributed real-time simulation that we are fully offering in a GPL V3 license scheme. That includes a set of tools. One is the Villas node, which is the gateway that allows you to post basically your laboratory on the internet. The Villas web, which is a web interface that can be used for planning, executing, and controlling the, the scenario of distributed simulation. DPSIM, the real-time simulation kernel, that based on dynamic phaser allows you to run a larger time step than EMT, so electromagnetic transient simulation. A SIM++, a library to parse SIM files and convert them in other language, in particular to convert for our DP SIM so that we can import data from SIM++. And last but not least, the Pintura, which is a web-based graphic editor that allows anybody to build a grid starting from the topology and automatically generate a CIM description of this grid. This is basically a view of the architecture and the integration of the different levels. On top, you see the, the Villas web, which allows you to uh, define service like data as a service and uh, to perform offline analysis. Um, and then different users can connect with a web-based approach. This is clearly a soft real-time integration layer because here it's not critical, um, the time stamping and so on. On the other hand, on the lower layer is the Villas um, most the hardest bust, let's say, which is the Villas FPGA, which allows also very tight interconnection also within a lab so that you can combine different platforms in real time um, in, the, in the laboratory. Um, for example, what we have done in our lab, we have connected Opal RT setup with RTDS setup we have in our lab. In the middle, the Villas node, which is vice versa, the over the internet, solution of posting different laboratory on the network. So VLAS is the acronym, it stands for virtual, virtual Interconnected Laboratories for Large System Simulation. That is this set of tools also all together. And um, as I mentioned in the architecture, we provide a set of services and interface. Some of them are hard, some are soft real-time interfaces. Goal, as mentioned, is the integration of geographically distributed hardware and software assets. And um, we provide also high level interface for, for data logging, simulation as a service, and data as a service. Key element is the gateway that allows the system to run. This is the Villas node. Villas node allows a traffic of protocols and translation with a large set of options. In this slide, you can see all the different protocols that have been integrated in Villas node. Villas node is fully uh, something that you can fully script. And with thanks to the script, you can create channels of data and moving data from one location to another, from one protocol to another. And this can go from one Villas node to another Villas node, can integrate the Villas FPGA, can integrate the Villas web, but then it brings some of the important um, technologies like real-time simulators like RTDS and OpalRT, but also Typhoon, integration with National Instrument LabVIEW, real-time target, and also some important standard protocol like uh, simple values in, in GOOS in 61850, Ethercat, and um, also cloud interfaces thanks to fiber solutions, so linked directly to, to the context broker. This is a, an example of a visualization based on the Villas web. So this is part of one of the largest experiments we did with this technology that was discussed uh, in few slides. But you can see that you have a variety of uh, options of visualization that can be enabled. And on the left, you see the menu that allows to go through different projects, simulation scenarios, and perform a user management type of setting. And the development has been now running for a few years in this direction. We started actually 
looking at the topic in 2013, working in a cooperative project with Norway called Crew of Great, and where we came up with the understanding of the need of this interdisciplinary interconnection intralab type of scenario that developed two years later with the first experiment that was a cooperation with Politecnico di Torino and the JRC, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Thanks to that experience, we ported the project in, in our university. We got the first uh, funding project called Villas, that is the cooperation between RDTI and Forschung Center Jurich, that's where Professor Benini is currently. Thanks to that work, two years later, we were able to perform the largest experiment we did which is the Global Real-Time Super Lab experiment that I will explain in a few slides. And then we were able to get a European project called Reserve, where we developed a lot of the technology that you saw in the previous slide. And now we have two running projects. One is a German project um, called um, Integrated Research Infrastructure, in German Interest Integrated Forschungs Infrastructure. And starting from this year, um, this basically logic of grid into a lab integration um, has been basically recognized as sort of standard European level. And we are part of the Horizon 2020 project Herigrid 2, which is linking a large set of laboratory across Europe, creating a unique European infrastructure for real time simulations and join hard in the loop experiment. Here you see a little bit of uh, the most significant experiment we did. This is the, the first one called the Eric Lab. There was a co-simulation scenario between Aachen, Politecnico di Torino, and two different locations at the Joint Research Center in, in Patton. The idea was to appreciate in real time the interaction of a distribution grid model in one of the Villas nodes in uh, in, uh, in Politecnico di Torino, um, together with the transmission system vice versa simulated in the Aachen location. So the more critical link that was going to the ultra-fast uh, European network for university, Geant, um, was between Torino and Aachen, vice versa, the less critical, so the lab to cloud type of interfaces were connecting us to the laboratory experiment in Istra in Italy, that is one of the locations of the GRC. From that knowledge, we put together an even more complex example. This is the one I mentioned before that was inspired by the cooperation between the Department of Energy US and the European Commission in Europe. Start thinking in this global sense for grid. We had the chance to put together a quite sophisticated experiment with eight locations six sitting in the US, two sittings in Europe. Again, a comparison between Aachen and Torino in Italy, and then by first looking at US, the University of South Carolina at the time was location where Professor Benini was working. So was, uh, again, a cooperation with him. The IDO National Lab playing the key node in the US kind of dispatcher, then National Renewable Lab, um, Colorado State University, Sandia National Lab, and Washington State University completed the scenario. What was nice here is that it was a combination of real-time simulation hard in the loop. As you can see from the little icons, some of the locations were running a controller hard in the loop, like in University of South Carolina. Other locations were connecting some large real test beds, like in Sandia, they were connecting their test bed for PV systems and the one in in Colorado from NREL was connecting the National Wind Technology Center. So even with this large distance with a lot of work on algorithms for compensating the delay, we were able to put together a quite significant experiment um, across such a large distance. Here you see a little bit more on the geographical perspective. The challenge was not only Europe, US, but also within the US, the distance between some of the laboratories was significant because somewhere on close to the West Coast, remember this the so-called mountain area in terms of time zone, somewhere on the East Coast. So even there, the distance was not um, 
and negligible. Yeah, with that, um, I hope I gave you a good overview of the opportunity that we have tried to open. And um, what is nice, this uh, setup is now currently used in the Energetica project in, uh, in Colombia. So very happy to see that our idea now get further developed and used by other users. And that's the best way to improve and you know, get the experience and move forward with the project with new development. Thank you for your attention. So thank you professor, for the presentation. This was very nice and um, yeah, a very nice uh, fit for the topic of the panel of today. And I think now it's my turn to uh, give a presentation. And after we will open the um, floor for question and discussion. Um, so um, I will share my screen. Mm, in just a second. Okay. Mm. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending where we are sitting. Um, so um, my name is Andrea Benigni, and uh, I want to take the chance first, uh, just a second, to introduce my institute, uh, since maybe it's a, it's a new institute, so it's less known in the community. Uh, we are seated in Julich, in the close proximity to Aachen in Germany, um, and uh, our work is mainly related to the development of methods and models for the design, scheduling, and control of energy system. And for energy system, we focus from relatively small system, like what could be a building or a district, uh, into industrial system, and more relevant for the audience today, to energy grids, so electric grid, but also uh, thermal and gas grids. And hydrogen now is becoming a big topic, obviously, all around the world. Uh, obviously, a big outcome for our institute is the development of software tools. So we are not looking at development of hardware products, but mainly software in terms of model libraries, optimization and control tools, ICT visualization and artificial intelligence uh, package, software package. Uh, when it comes to real-time simulation, we actually the, my, I'm very glad for the presentation that came today before mine because uh, provide an overview of very different, uh, many different application of real-time simulation. Actually, I had this slide to serve a little bit as introductory uh, slide for myself, and this one it's an example, we, an exercise actually we performed a few years ago um, when I was working at University of South Carolina. And what you see here, it's a very well-known network, the IEEE 123, uh, where it's slightly modified, so we insert uh, eight PV uh, plant location. And what we were testing in a hardware-in-the-loop way, controller hardware-in-the-loop way, was the centralized algorithm for uh, voltage control. And uh, we test this one with the simulation of the power system, but also with an emulation of the communication network, because since this one was a um, yeah, coordinated control, where the different controller interact in a peer-to-peer -peer way, it was also important to emulate uh, the communication network effect that affect uh, the convergence time of the algorithm. So this one, uh, it's just an example of how real-time simulation is used. Uh, but if you have used real-time simulation in your life, you know that simulating already a system of this size uh, can be challenging. Um, typically, you need to parallelize the solution of a circuit of this type over different processor. And this decoupling and parallelization is somehow troublesome. Uh, the situation becomes even more challenging if you want to include a um, very detailed model of power electronics converter. Um, so this one brings to uh, what I would like to introduce today, that is a uh, result of a project that we got for many years, founded by the Office of Naval Research in the US. Uh, and the project focuses on the development of uh, methods, first of all, and after a software tool for real-time simulation of uh, high switching frequency uh, converter, mainly uh, following the development of silicon carbide and gallium nitride device, um, 
in with very small time step, uh, but developing also methods that allow to maintain a system view. Uh, typically, there are tools that allow to have some uh, detailed representation of power electronics device, uh, not below 100 nanoseconds, but maybe in the range of 500 nanoseconds, some commercial tool exists, uh, but they typically scale very poorly. So the main goal for this project was support very fast uh, real-time simulation and also provide a infinitely scalable, I like to say, methodologies that doesn't involve the user in the partitioning phase. Uh, I will show now in the next slide how the tool works and how the methods has been developed, but I just want to mention that uh, we uh, released this tool as an open source tool, so it's available online under the name Ortis. And what this tool allows to do is to generate in an automated way C++ code that can then be synthesized for execution on FPGAs for exactly real-time simulation of power electronics system. Um, the, the method that we develop is actually a method we developed many years ago with at the time of my PhD. And it's uh, from a mathematical point of view, uh, nothing more than a mixed integration scheme where explicit and implicit integration are combined uh, in a clever way. And so the, the, the source of the method stay, now these are combined. The, the basic idea is to assign uh, an explicit integration methods to every nonlinear component while maintaining an implicit integration method for all the linear. Uh, the big advantage of this partitioning without going too much detail is that every nonlinear component represented with an um, explicit integration method can be solved in parallel without any partitioning from the user point of view. And the linear part of the network can be largely pre-computed or pre-factorized to speed up the execution time during real-time operation. Uh, thanks to this, uh, we achieved effectively real-time operation with time step uh, of about 50 nanoseconds. Uh, we typically limit at 50 nanoseconds, even if with modern hardware, we now reach about 30, 35 nanoseconds uh, for system of very different sizes. So I, will, I want to show, talk a little bit more about the scalability in the next slide. This one is mainly to show a couple of different examples. Now we can go from a single converter system to uh, simulation to a, a simulation of a system of converters like the one that you see in the bottom left of the slide. And at the same time, we can have this high level view of in this case, it's a microgrid of a ship system while also including very high level, very uh, small level details. So in the bottom right figure here, you see the typical output of uh, a, a, an inverter, a converter, power electronics inverter, with the resolution of the dead time of the inverter while maintaining the system level uh, simulation. What is more uh, interesting here, oh, sorry, is that not only uh, we can use this one for high switching frequency converter, so 100 kilohertz, 200 kilohertz converter, uh, but the same method can also become useful for um, simulation, for example, for the C system. This one is a project that uh, another uni University of Wisconsin uh, carried out recently using the tool that we develop. Um, and in this case, the converter was switching at a relatively slow frequency, I don't even remember. Uh, but the particular interest for them was the fast trans transitory uh, that uh, happened after a fault on the DC side of the converter. And we compare the result here. You can see the, uh, the, the needed resolution from the uh, resonance frequency uh, of, of the network. And so with the uh, resonance frequency of about, uh, of about 125 kilohertz, we can see that uh, we have a period of about nine microseconds, period that will be hard to visualize with time step in the range of microseconds, clearly. Um, we develop uh, the, the code that we generate can then be synthesized using um, dedicated tools that are available commercially and can be deployed on very different uh, platforms. So we can go from, um, let's say, prototypical um, platform or prototype type platform like the uh, demo board from Xilinx down to uh, more user-ready hardware like national instrument uh, systems.
what is the main achievement I would say of this tool is the scalability. So what you see here is a microgrid test where we simply start adding converters one after the other. And on the left side, we show how the computational delay and the resource usage increase with the adding of the converter. And typically, as reference, we have to always to keep in mind that we know that with the traditionally MTP type of algorithm, the computational cost will scale with the cube of the size of our system. So as you can see from the blue line, this, the, the time step stay basically constant here. The, it's a very zoomed in, but we basically have a constant um, computational delay and so time, a loud time step. Uh, the resource usage, obviously, there is nothing for free, so uh, we pay this one somewhere and we pay this one in the resource usage that grow linearly with the size of the system. This is already, uh, I would consider, a very good result because I expect uh, to have more of a cubic uh, scale here, or quadratic at least. Obviously, we support not only traditional, what the, the example that I showed you before, where uh, let's say two stage converter, we have also MMC models, we have uh, dual active, active bridge models, and um, the user can define his own models and integrate this model in the tool for code generation. Uh, we support also to gain scalability, and we also support multi FPGA execution when the resource of one FPGA get. Uh, uh, are not enough for the size of the system, we can move to a multiple FPGA uh, simulation. We are actually, uh, we already did test with two FPGA, we are preparing a test with three FPGA and with multi-rating execution using also uh, an Opal RT system. Uh, this one is just to conclude, uh, a block diagram representation of the tools and how the code generation works. And yeah, that's all for my presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, I think now we want to. Um, I cannot. Okay. Either I can, if you want, I can moderate the question. Yes, I would kindly ask you to moderate the question so that. Uh, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, uh, all the presenters uh, today. It's very interesting. I will try to moderate uh, all the questions. So if you have uh, any questions, you can do it uh, uh, by the chat or you can raise your hand. Uh, there is an icon next to your, your avatar. It is an icon and you can raise your hand and we can uh, give the word to, to the question. So if there is anyone, I'm just trying here wants to make a question let me see i know there was some questions there juan oh, paulo did you have one you so yeah can you hear me yes okay, okay professor benin and professor monty uh, in the review and discussion paper, real-time simulation-based testing of modern energy systems, where both of you are outdoors, you highlight the role of large-scale RT simulation to validate the integration of new applications in cyber-physical energy systems. Can you please give us more details of the importance of this in the guidelines of the Eric Grid's holistic test description method from the European perspective, and how us here in Colombia can start adopting it in our experimental designs. I let Professor Monti reply if he doesn't mind, because Eric Greed and this type of application are very much the focus of his institute. So I will let him reply and eventually add this. Yeah, the, the, the CTA, so the, the, the first one to, to, to the Eric Greed, uh, the, the Eric Greed is trying to uh, create a way to openly cooperate across Europe. And um, we are defining protocols to, to do that. So go beyond Villas. So Villas is just one of the enablers. It's not everything that is developing in that context. So there are other solutions also. And um, we are 
anticipating that uh, the more we move in this direction, the more we may need also specific data models to support this interaction of laboratory with, because no one of the data models is perfectly suited for the simulation scenarios and interaction that we have. Uh, but um, all in all, this is emerging as a critical uh, solution to enhance collaboration. One of the main reasons why um, we think this, this type of cooperation, starting the cooperation this way is really important, is because it simplifies dramatically legal issues related to data management. So if I have to imagine an experiment between Germany and France, and I have to move everything to Germany, there will be inf infinite issues of data privacy, data security, and everything between the two countries. We need to sign 300 non-disclosure agreements and, and so on and so forth. And vice versa, what Eric Grid is enabling and also the vision coming from Villa is that everybody keeps his own data and everything you share are interfaces. And this is really creating an open community in which there is no concern and you can have partners like a grid operator in your project and they can be sure that you don't need to give any of your information to the other partner. But at the end, you may imagine the future, the computers will make possible huge computation in one location, much more than what we could do today. We would, I don't imagine the future will get rid of lawyers and that's why I think Villas has a long life anyway. Thank you, Professor. Very good. Um, there is another question for from Andres to Professor Benini. But did you decide to use explicit integration methods for nonlinear systems? One will expect that the implicit ones could improve the stability of these systems. Yeah, for sure, I can try this. This one, it's, it's pleasure to reply because it's my favorite activity. So uh, <laughs> uh, I can say yes, that's one hundred percent true. Uh, an implicit method would have helped, and that's what normally uh, I would say every um, circuit level simulation tool uses. So spice uh, to cite the family, they say. Uh, the problem in our case was that uh, in using an implicit integration method, also for um, no linear components, uh, the conductance matrix of our uh, circuit uh, becomes obviously dependent on the operating point and so needs to be refactorized at every uh, time step. Plus, there is no parallelization possibility of the solution. Um, in this way, using an explicit integration method for this no linear component, we achieve the two goals. That is, we, we don't have to uh, recompute the conductance matrix at every uh, simulation step, so we can pre-compute a lot of stuff offline. Plus, we have the possibility to parallelize the solution of the different nonlinear components because only depends from the previous time step. Uh, there are clearly a lot of concern about uh, um, stability and accuracy when doing this. Um, we did the long analysis, analytical, and with a few examples of the stability of the methods and obviously there are some limits but uh, in many cases what we saw is that uh, the time step required for an appropriate uh, resolution of power electronic system was smaller than the time step required for a stable solution so um, this somehow uh, give us courage many years ago to go this direction uh, another important aspect is that uh, linear multi-step compound method, that is what our method is, so a combination of different integration uh, methods, the stability proper, uh, property of uh, the combination of the two uh, integration method is always better than the stability property of the worst of the two integration methods. So bottom line, having a combination of implicit and implicit allow us to improve a little bit the performance of the explicit uh, integration. That's why we don't do everything with explicit and we mix uh, the two methods. If I can add uh, something, it's what I would call the paradox of real-time simulation. So the, the reason why we care about the stability of uh, implicit method is because normally, not in real time, we try to make the time step um, as long as possible, as big as possible. In real time, we are trying exactly the opposite. So we are shooting for as short as possible to increase the accuracy, and that's where you get to this inverse logic with respect to what you find in books on 
on simulation, which has already the opposite concern. I want to make the time step longer so that I don't have to wait too much when I'm looking at the screen in my computer. But in real time simulation, as Professor Bellini well explained, we are trying to go to nanoseconds. At that point, there is no real issue with explicit methods, at least for the electrical component. Well, thank you. Uh, we, we have some other questions from uh, Hugo Perez uh, to Mauricio. This is question to Mauricio of the XM. Uh, how, preval how prevalent is the use of the special protection schemes in the Colombian system? Also, how are the PMUs installed in your system? And then I will ask some other day. Excuse Mauricio. me, Ernesto. Is, uh, the question is how far? How prevalent is the use of special protection scheme in Colombia? Oh, okay, and right now we are investigating on that. Uh, we know for sure that uh, we're going to have to have installed in the power system some special protection schemes to prevent uh, the power system from, from um, partial blackouts or complete blackouts. This is the topic or this is the interest of this special one. That is installed in the south of Colombia, in the front, in the border with with Ecuador. Um, we think, and we are right now um, visualizing that, uh, foreseeing that maybe with the with the incoming of uh, uh, wind parks in the north uh, and of the Colombian power system up there in the La Guajira, maybe we could have uh, the need of a, have one special protection scheme for the loss of those of those uh, wind generators and prevent the system from uh, deep frequencies and, and, and spikes in frequencies, uh, try to develop something new with the with the low frequency, uh, low shading scheme, for example. This is something that uh, right now we're, we're foreseeing. Um, right now, we're investigating on that and we're improving our test bed. Uh, as you can see, we can run very fast and very accurate. We can process the results very, very fast and accurate uh, way. Uh, we have to further develop this test bed in order not to not just to incorporate one uh, protect protection or one equipment alone, but to incorporate the most, most of one, two or three uh, hardware in, in, in the solution. Uh, we also have uh, the idea to develop this test bed in a, in, in a way that we can also prove or, or incorporate not only protection, but also control. Uh, not 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 the way in in that uh, only can test the sim simple trips uh, to circuits or to loads or to generators, but also uh, de define design a test bed to be able to test the uh, controls in real time. That's something that we are thinking to to investigate next year. Okay, uh, Mauricio, there is some other question related with the uh, PMUs. So how are this information used? So if it is uh, bring to some data to the control center or it's just used to uh, after a fact event analysis or something like that? Now, right now, the, the our WAM system, our white area monitoring system, uh, incorporates uh, around 110, 109 PM, PMUs. Uh, we have uh, 40, around 40 PMUs that, is, that are installed it will spread in the in the in the most important substation in, in Colombia. Uh, we also have the this information deployed as a backup uh, in the in the control center is being uh, is sharing the control center with information uh, provided provided by PMUs with the normal information provided by the by regular RTUs uh, that uh, compose with SCADA. Uh, that is used mainly for supervision. Uh, we have applications of uh, uh, for, for the moment uh, in for protection. The the one that I just described the the protection scheme with Ecuador, and we're thinking to also to incorporate that in the future uh, for control. Uh, right now, those applications are in software in the loop. Uh, they are in the in a prototype. We have uh, the intention to move that to hardware in the in the coming years, but right now our WAMS is a good information for the for the operators in the, in, in our control center, and they use it as a backup in, in right now, and in particular in the frontier in the in the border with Ecuador, they use it in real time 
we have a special screen and they in, in, in they, they can see the behavior, the, the power, the voltage, and everything in, in graphic trends, and they are able to control the interconnection in real time with the use of PMUs. Uh, it turns out that this special scheme not only does the protection function, but also provides the synchronization information for, for the operators in the control center. Thank you, Mauricio. Um, I have one, one, one other question that could be uh, answered by any panelists, but probably uh, Victor mentioned that in the presentation, so I will ask to him first. It's, it's related with the digital twins that you mentioned in, in your presentation. So I, I think it's uh, and Professor Monti uh, said that one of the one of the success in a real time simulation is related with the model modeling and some of the models are not shared freely to to other other companies to to simulate. So how do you see this a digital twin will work? With these constraints that we have uh, with the models, uh, for example, in a not not a huge uh, infrastructure, just for example, for the Colombian one, there are some some models that are related with the solar system and the inverters and the uh, solar uh, sorry the wind power. There are some difference in between the controls that they make. So, what what do you think will, will be the digital twins aspect? You see, this uh, will be yeah, a success. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting topic. Actually, currently, I'm working on a project preparation to go to Europe and see Germany on this topic. Um, because one thing that is to me clear uh, when it comes to a digital green in large scale, this will be an interaction of a system of systems because different manufacturers will deliver their own digital twin and. Uh, with the same logic, you will not be able to access their model or any internal. So it will be important to, to have probably two levels. So one end is the integration level, let me call it, which is a solver, like put together all the different components. And you know, in our view, DPSIM could be playing this role given the different capability of details they give you with the time step. At the same time, a set of API that allow you to talk to um, the digital twin provided by the manufacturers to extract information that allow you at the edge to bring the information in the network. Um, I think this is some other way out uh, because, you know, Siemens will not give me all the information about the digital twin or their transformer or whatever equipment because it's part of the intellectual property. Okay. Have they, there is any uh, digital twins Experiment running right now that there could be a demonstration. I don't know if Victor has. A... Uh, yes, uh, we, we do have some projects uh, like experiments running at the moment. Uh, I cannot go further in, in details of those projects because it's still in the beginning phase of the development. But the idea is to have a, a simulator uh, acting as a digital twin. Uh, to optimize the the control uh, scheme of the the grid, and because if it's all um, uh, in a simulated environment, you can test it before uh, to deploy in the field, and that's the the main advantage to have a digital twins to uh, provide those um, I would say online information and change the parameters of the protection schemes to you know have uh, uh, always uh, better and better um, uh, uh, protection on the grid and this is uh, I would say it's um, it's not the um, like a, a state of the art uh, application because some customers have done these before uh, this is kind of the a different way to see the 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 uh, real time simulation and and as professor monty said uh it's is really important to protect the the ip on those models because this is uh, i would say the the core of the application and uh, there are some ways to do that you can encapsulate the the ip and to protect that 
uh, and, and just integrating the rest of the models. Um, but uh, uh, I agree this is uh, still in the, the discussion phase and there are many uh, procedures that we, we need to define before to become a, a more um, uh, optional or uh, application uh, which everyone can use. I, I, I have a contribution here. Uh, from I just forgot to mention that we were also uh, we were also running a project uh, this year in the past year with the with the development that we have done and in, in, in most taking into account that we have a, we have a, a reached a, ma a good match between the Dixieland power factory model and the EFA sourcing model. So we are confident that uh, we can trust the, the, the results in, of the EFA sourcing tool. And in, in, in this year, we have also used the, this tool and the, uh, the real-time simulation of the complete power system to train the operators in the use of, the, of our WAMs. So we emulate some uh, uh, operation of the power system. We also try to emulate a, a partial blackout in the north uh, of Colombia and try to, to uh, show the operators how the WAMs will react to that blackout. So we did that the, 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 this year too. We were successful, and they were very happy to see that uh, uh, the, the, the simulator and the tools uh, of the real time can can also be used to train operators in the future. So of course we are kind of far of uh, having that as a as a digital twin, and um, a digital twin that can help the operator to to take actions or to advise some ma maneuvers in, in in real time because we have to. Uh, develop. Uh, we have to improve a lot, and we have to put a lot of effort in improving the the, the, the models, the dynamic models, the the generator models, the, the even the parameters of the of the actual devices, the lines, transformers, and so on in the power system. So we we are in the, in a very early stage of the development of, of the development of a digital a digital twin. I think. Okay, thank you, Maurice. There is another question for Mr. Hirata. It's uh, cloud services. Uh, cloud services are getting more and more popular in the sector, given the reduction cost that on-demand usage of platform can represent to the customer. Is Opal RT working on this direction of cloud services? Uh, yes, uh, we do have right now an option to run HyperSync. Uh, which is our uh, real-time uh, tool, because uh, just a very brief explanation, uh, mainly we work with two different platforms. Uh, one is based on uh, MATLAB Simulink uh, environment, uh, where you uh, the user uh, deploy the, the models using Simulink, and then we compile and run in real-time. But also we do have a HyperSyn, uh, which is the, the tool developed by IREC, as I showed uh, during my presentation. And it's a, a standalone environment uh, with all the libraries, the components uh, necessary to, to develop the models. And right now we have this platform running in, in cloud uh, because we, we, we have a, a partnership with Amazon Cloud uh, to have um, like a multiple cores and run uh, complex uh, models. Uh, we know that this is the beginning uh, because uh, we limited the, the, the application because if we are running the cloud, we cannot uh, uh, connect to, to iOS uh, or, or physical um, devices, as, which is the main benefit to use a real-time simulation. Uh, right now, we just can run the, the, the models in a, on a farm uh, computing, uh, if it, especially if it's a very complex model. But we are working on that, and uh, we, we also see this is as a future. Uh, and uh, uh, many universities uh, are working on that uh, direction to be able to connect those simulators uh, together. Uh, we do have experiments also in Brazil uh, where the uh, Energy uh, Research Center, CEPEL, we, uh, is want to connect their simulator to some universities. Uh, also in Mexico, uh, they want to do the same. Uh, so this is, uh, I, I see this is as a future, but uh, uh, there are uh, many, th many 
steps to 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 do before to get there okay thank you uh no, there is any other question or I don't know. I have a question for Victor, and maybe, maybe Monty can, uh, Professor Monty can also address some some answer. So I, I was uh, interested in the in the topic of uh, cloud simulation, real time simulation. How far do you see that we can do the the the, the cloud simulation in real time and fit actual devices on field? Uh, yeah, that, that's the point, Mauricio, that I, I was uh, trying to, to explain. Uh, right now, uh, what we can do is to uh, simulate the, the models uh, in a cloud computing. Uh, so, uh, and, and then you can, uh, I would say, rent out engineering hours. So let's say that you want to run your model uh, and that would take one or two days, uh, you can rent uh, days of uh, a simulation in a cloud computing but uh, this is only on the the modeling let's say uh, if you are uh, uh, performing a model in the loop uh, simulation uh, if you need rcp or or hard in the loop right now it is not possible to perform that because it's in a in a cloud uh, uh, environment and but we are working on that uh, to provide some options and uh, one one of the ideas would be to uh, to have uh, some uh, simulators uh, for rent uh, if the, the customer wants to perform just a, a specific study on 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 a, a topic. Uh, but uh, uh, this is uh, we are trying to find some uh, models how to to provide that to to our customers. What I can add from, from my side is that uh, one technology that can help in this direction is edge cloud. So having an intermediate layer on the edge, this is now becoming very effective, uh, for example, in by using 5G technology that allows stream of data extremely fast from a field to an edge cloud. It's something we have been doing uh, not for simulation purpose, but uh, from the point of view of virtualizing fully the automation of a substation in the edge cloud so that uh, the control of the substation will not be run anymore on computers sitting in the substation, but will be isolated in the 5G network. We have uh, close cooperation with Ericsson that uh, produced the technology, and we have uh, developed specific uh, uh, communication that allows the data to stay local in the edge cloud so they don't get all the delay that otherwise will be coming from the core network in the, the wireless communication. And then from there, you could um, link to the cloud. So you have an intermediate stage of processing that will be on the edge. And that's, you know, some in the direction of things like smart cities are also doing. It's a huge amount of data streamed and, and locally processed at first in, in the edge and then uh, upper layer in the cloud. But of course, when you add this layer, then you can have some limitation on the on the time steps that you can, so we don't talk about microseconds anymore, for sure. Yeah. But uh, we are couple. working on kilohertz type of uh, connection um, because we are virtualizing uh, completely also sensors this way. So this is becoming technologically possible. Yeah, I think we can go put more effort, more effort on that. And I was thinking that maybe you could, we could get to a point and we can uh, stream 61, 850 goose and sample values through a high speed network and, 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 and close the loop. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. <laughs> you're streaming simple values 61, 850. <laughs> uh, yeah, if I can add, I think the, the way of in which I see a, a situation like that is. The delay limits it's the only limit to your bandwidth so as long as you have a delay if as long as you are interested in dynamic that are slow enough uh, that that should be possible and if you have an intermediate computing actually that's very interesting you can maybe smooth down some of the dynamic there and um, ensure stability still yeah uh just one comment uh, to add uh to the to this discussion uh, we have worked uh, with some customers. Uh, one of them is ONS in, in Brazil. 
And I believe that the University of Aachen also did the same. It's a co-simulation between uh, even different uh, uh, vendors of uh, real-time simulation, uh, which is RTDS and, and OpenRT. And uh, the ONS, uh, which is uh, the, the Brazilian operator, the energy operator, uh, could uh, uh, perform a simulation uh, where part of the, the model was running in the FPGA board from RTDS, and other part of the, the model was running in, in our FPGA. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, but of course, the, the connection between those uh, simulators is through a uh, um, SFP connection, a digital protocol. And, but they, they could prove that the result was, was uh, uh, far enough uh, to, to, to decouple the model uh, between two, two platforms. Uh, but still, this is the, the limitation and that will depend on what you want to simulate. Uh, because uh, there are many ways to connect uh, 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 different simulators together. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the Universidad Nacional, we are working also in that. As from some master thesis is working on what are the capabilities of cloud computing for real time simulation. So it will be very interesting to share. Um, University of Aachen is in cooperation with this thesis, so it would be very interesting. Um, I don't have um, more questions from, from the chat, uh, and I don't see if there is any other participant that would like to, to share or make some comment. If you can open the, the microphone, if you want to comment something before we, we just go to the final part of this webinar. Okay. Uh, okay. If there is not a more more question, I would like just to to mention. Uh, I will share my screen. Um, this is part of the uh, this webinar. Are part of Energetica. It's a project. I just invite you all of you to get into the, the web page of Energetica, and we have uh, several other webinars that we are going to do this semester so uh, please just uh, be connected to to them and next next uh, webinar will be related with a co-simulation framework that we are developing in energetica with all the partners and it's something that we are developing here in colombia just to connect with other um, simulators but also some of the cloud um that we would like to, to make in like a control room in a cloud. Uh, it is some of the framework that we are developing. So we want to share this. Uh, it will be the next uh, webinar. And there will be some other webinars. Here there is a mistake on the, on the date, but we like to fix it. And we have a program all, all the webinars to the, the end of the year. So you are very, invite, uh, very welcome to, to come here. Also, these webinars we will share uh, on a YouTube channel. Let me see. We have a YouTube channel of Energetica, so we are starting just to to populate with all the webinars and videos that are uh, getting from this uh, project. So you are very, really welcome to 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 this. So that's what I want to share and um, thank all the panelists uh, and. Professor Benini, Professor Monti, Mauricio Sanchez, uh, and Victor Girata for for the participation and the commitment in these uh, these topics. So uh, we were really delighted to to hear from you those advances that is in this in this topic. So thank you very much for all all participants. Um, see you in the next webinar. It's, uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. See you. Bye bye. Very interesting. Thank bye. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye all. Bye.